I'm going to talk to you about some, some of the, like a very hands-on approach, like how we solved four or five problems that we had when we were wanting to do automated testing, uh, which maybe some of you have found as well. Um, and so just to give some context, like at Cedars we have a monolith application, so like all, all the like sites, platform, the admin uh, interface are all run you know, from the same Rails project, so it's kind of a big project. Uh, just using rake stats, which is not very uh, you know uh, precise, but uh, so 36k line of code, 49k line of tests, so one to 1.4 code to test ratio, so more tests than code. So we have quite a big um, test test suite, uh, and that's not counting the 700 cucumber scenarios that we also have. Does everyone know what cucumber is? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 5,000 R spec. So 45 minutes to run the, the suite if, if running on a, like a single core on a fairly recent computer. Um, in our continuous integration, we kind of parallelize the tests, so it takes 12 minutes. That's not so bad. But yeah, it's a it's a big big test suite, um, and so it, it costs a lot to maintain and, and to develop. So why do we do it? Uh, basically, peace of mind. So we have we've had a thousand releases over four years. That's you know some companies do more, some companies do less, but. Uh, we had a lot of releases over four years, and, and all of those we could make uh, with no fear of, of any breakage whatsoever, just precisely because we have such a, a large uh, automated testing suite that makes sure everything will, will go well. Um, so for, for our testing stack, we use RSpec. So how many use RSpec? Yeah, well, majority. Uh, not that we die of love for our spec, it's just another testing framework. We, we could use Minitest or, or some other framework. So, so a few of, of the examples will be uh, RSpec specific, but you know they, they could be easily adapted to other frameworks. Uh, we also use Q Cucumber. Cucumber is you know, just a way of, of writing in plain text, and then it's one-to-one -one correspondence with, with Ruby code. So again, some of the examples are in Cucumber, but could easily uh, be adapted to other frameworks. Uh, we also use Capybara for end-to-end -end testing, like browser testing of launching the browser, which is we use PhantomJS, then clicking links and, and checking the contents. Who here uses end-to-end -end testing, end-to-end -end browser testing? So not a lot, okay. Um, and yeah, a few, a few of the examples of, a few of the difficulties we, we've had uh, was, were re regarding this. So just, just a bit of, of background, of context. Uh, the way we look at tests, so, or, you have like the white box text tests, you have the black box tests. Essentially, when you do a test, you have like three scopes to manage. That is like the size of the subject of the test, like what's, what are you testing effectively? Um, the context that, that is real, like the context in which the test runs, that is your real application. And the context that you will stop in the test, right? And so by, by making different, uh, by choosing different options, uh, on these three um, factors, you'll have uh, you know more of a white box test or more of a black box test, and we can also look at it as like a more of a developer centric test and more of a user centric test. Right? User cares about behavior, developer cares about how the code is structured, and uh, and so for any feature that we develop, we kind of our process is we will develop lots of de developer centric tests. That's like the, your unit tests. Uh, testing like each corner case that you want to test, and just a few user-centric tests, for example, like Cucumber end-to-end -end testing uh, with Capybara, uh, just just to map out the journey that the user would have to follow in order to use the feature. And and importantly, for any bug that we find in production that eluded us when when you know during the development process, well, we have to like we have the rule to make a regression test, and we will want to make that regression test. <coughs> as user-centric as possible, or as user-centric as manageable. That's, that's because if we developers did not find that bug when developing, uh, then at least let's, let's make sure that from the point of view of the user, like we have the test guaranteeing that that specific bug will not happen again. Right. So, and this will help explain like some of the examples that we have. So I have, I think, five examples <coughs> of, of just difficulties that, that we found and, and the way uh, we worked around it, uh, starting from the very simple and, and a bit more complex at the end. So desert test, <coughs> this is just the principle uh, that your test should be able to run in the desert, i.e. Uh, with no internet connection. For a number of reasons, like 
connection could go down and the test failed and you don't realize why. You can actually be blocked for over usage of, of APIs that, that happened to us when we didn't do this. And you know, even if you say, oh, I have that under control, it will never happen, it just slows down tests. It just slows down tests to, to go to the internet. There's no need. Uh, you should make sure that your tests are not uh, requesting to the internet. So solutions to that, there's gems such as WebMock, FakeWeb, and there are a bunch of others that just like re-implement the, um, the basic networking methods of Ruby uh, and they won't request out to the internet. You can configure them to either print out a warning or, or just have a raise an error uh, when it happens, so that's great. And that takes care of, of like RSpec, like code that runs server side, so to speak. Uh, but when you use when you use end-to-end -end testing in a browser, you also have a different process running at the same time, which is the browser process, right? And those gems do not cover that. So uh, you have to be aware of like simple things, like if you include, for example, we have a font from typekit.com in our main layout, uh, or you could have like analytics or whatever service you use. Just just take care not to include those in the, in the test environment, that's in, either by testing the environment or environment variables. If, for, so yeah, just a simple tip uh, to be aware of. And then like a subcase of this is third party events. So in this case, Customario is a, is a service that allows you to send emails. Like you send events to Customario and they, they fire an email to the user. And we wanted to test um, that the event was being sent. We found out a bug, uh, turns out the event wasn't being sent. So uh, not only do we want to not send the actual request of course, to, to the service, we want to kind of test that it was sent. So the way we figured out to do it, it's just very simple. You start up with, a, uh, with an array, and then uh, you re-implement the track method to just add to the array. And at the end, you do the cleanup, you clean up the array, and you uh, re-implement the method to become the original version again. And this allows you to, either in Cucumber, or, or if you could do it in RSpec, uh, like with this tag, Customario, it, it's configured to run the before book and the after book. And then we have uh, just a simple step, one Customario event that they should have been sent, and this just checks that you know, uh, the event is there in that array. Um, yeah. And um, third, problems with, with Ajax. So before we get into Ajax, let me uh, give a bit of context of, of kind of the um, kind of end-to-end -end web tests that we have. So. You have things like, even I am on homepage, I follow foo, that, that would be like a link that was there, that clicks the link, and I follow bar, and that would be like following another link. So just with this simple text uh, test, with the, at least with the default steps that, that you know, Capybara provides you, uh, you would have a flaky error actually, because when you follow the link foo, and then you say I follow bar, that does not necessarily wait for the whole page to load after you clicked on foo. And so sometimes it will pass because the message only came after the page had, had loaded. And sometimes it will fail because the page didn't, didn't fully load, right? And uh, with the default steps, you can, it's very simple to solve this. When I follow through and then you say, then I should see bar. And that is, this step by default is actually configured to wait uh, for a predefined timeout uh, for the content to appear. And then you can follow bar safely and it will work. So this problem is solved, but then when you have an Ajax request, and in particular, when the, re the response of the Ajax request, like you don't want to do anything with it, you don't want to inform the user or make any change to the page, so you cannot test any change to the page, so how do you do it? So like when I follow foo, then like a foo should exist in the database, or uh, whatever, like a foo event should have been sent to the customer IO services, uh, service. Uh, so how do you, like you have flake here, how do you solve it? So um, we actually found this on, on the web. Uh, you can do a step like this, given uh, I wait for the Ajax request to finish, and then you can do it. So we can look at this, the way this is implemented, or yeah, before that. Another example that we found that really, that really get our heads in. So we had a, like a scenario, I placed it here, like given this, then that. Uh, and actually, this was causing, um, this was leaving an Ajax request pending at the end, okay? And sometimes the request would run successfully before Cucumber would pass to the next text, so that would be all right. And sometimes Cucumber would pass to the next text, test, the uh, Ajax request then reached the server, and that caused an error. And Cucumber then reported the error 
as happening in the next test. <laughs> that it was, so it was very hard to track this down. I think actually, okay, the rule track this down. I think so. Yeah, uh, when you were in serious. And so, yeah, the way we did it, we just add that step at the end, and this fixes it. We could also just by default run this step on every test, maybe the, the safer way. For now, we only <coughs> have one test that has this problem. So. Uh, but yeah, we can look at the, so the way to implement that is that we just include a JavaScript just, just for the test environment, and this was taken from a public just. So it just defines like a global variable running AJAX calls and re-implements, so we, we use jQuery, so it's using jQuery as well. Just re-implements the AJAX function, so whenever you make an AJAX call, it adds to the variable, and then on success or on error, you subtract. And so you have that variable available with how many requests are pending, and then you can do a, a step like this where you, you just evaluate the JavaScript in the browser and make sure the, uh, the variable is zero uh, <coughs> for the loop and the sleep. And that's also cool. Anyway, so it's getting more complicated now. Uh, performance. Uh, so we, f uh, we found it useful. Yeah, first of all, the problem. Sometimes we have n plus 1 queries that, that just creep up uh, out of nowhere. And um, when we find them and we fix them, we want to make sure that they don't creep up again, right? So we found it useful to, to have a, a kind of a performance test that just counts the queries. It's a very simple thing. It's not the end-all, be-all for performance tests, but we found it useful to have uh, such a thing. So for example, we deal with campaigns and, and investments. So um, just creating a campaign, creating 11 investments, and when we close it, we expect it not to exceed 10 queries. So that, uh, that's a guarantee that there's no n plus 1 queries on the investments, which, which was a problem that we once had. Um, so yeah, this uh, expects the operation not to exceed the query limits. That's like a, an RSpec measure that we've implemented. And we can look at it here. So it's just a uh, RSpec measure supports block expectations. So we can have a block. Uh, and what it does is just it calls this method query count, which is the heart of it. It should be uh, larger than expected. Well, if it is, you know, uh, it will match. And then what it's using, it's using active active support notifications and subscribing to an event, which is SQL.active record. That's an event that Rails fires every time there's a query to the database. So we're just subscribing to that event uh, with uh, with our own class, which is active record uh, query counter is defined here, yeah. And basically, yeah, this will run this callback as a lambda, forget about this thing. This will run this, this callback every time a query is posted and we just, there's some queries we want to ignore, we don't want to count them, but yeah, just every query that is made, we add to the counter and then we have the, you can see what the counter is at the end. And cool thing though is, if, if we're in verbose mode, we can actually print out each query as it's being made, and it's very helpful to actually you know, figure out what's happening and, and how to optimize uh, or how to fix this test if the problem ever uh, occurs again. Okay. Uh, concurrency. So con concurrency problems like uh, you read from the database, you write, from, you write to the database, that's all fine and it works, but now you have two process reading and writing. And if you don't take care to do the proper locking, you will have concurrency issues, right? And at, like at ultra scale, you will, there's ways to deal with this, like um, allow them to write, but then have a process that goes back and, and fixes things. But we're not we're not that kind of company uh, yet, at least. So we, we just we just in the classic model of you know there's things that you need to watch out for in, in race conditions, and, and you should take care to lock those operations properly. Okay. And just sometimes that's obvious, but sometimes that's not so obvious. And so we've had bugs in the past uh, with concurrency issues, right? And one way to make sure that we don't have those problems again uh, is just by using Fork. So we just started with a very simple implementation using Ruby's process.fork. Okay, and basically this method allows you to make concurrent calls to a block that you pass. And it basically it needs to do a few things. It needs to um, reopen the standard error and standard out to dev null, uh, just not to mess around with the main logs of the main uh, process, if you will. 
And it also needs to disconnect from the database in the main process and then reconnect in the uh, forked processes. So that's just something we found out that was needed. Uh, and yeah, so it will run the blocks, it will wait for, for each process. And this way, we can have very simple tests like uh, we create a deposit and then on the same deposit, we try to confirm it twice at the same time. Um, and then we're making sure that it only created one movement of funds at the end. And so this means that one of the confirmed calls has failed, as it should. Uh, and yeah, uh, basically if this test fails, uh, we can have users um, gaming our, our you know, financial system to, to have more money than they should. Um, so this is a simple test where you, you, you're just calling one method and making sure, like twice or more, and making sure that it doesn't do the wrong thing. But sometimes you need more. Sometimes you need, to, you need to test for a specific race condition that happens at a specific point of the code, right? So it's like, so this thread happened and it was right about to confirm and then this other thread came in and did this. So you need to, uh, in order to be able to test that, there's a check uh, which is called fork break, which is, allows you to fork to a new process and then use breakpoints, just like you would do in a, in a debugger uh, environment. Right? And so that's, that's what we use for, this more, for these more uh, complex cases. And so we just have kind of the same function here. It now does not receive a single block, it just receives you know, uh, two or more execution blocks. And it, it again does the same thing of reopening the logs, reestablishing the connection to the database. It calls the blocks and passes here a, a variable which it comes from the fork break gem. So we're now, now using the fork break process instead of uh, vanilla Ruby process. Um, Ruby fork and uh, it has this variable breakpoints and that that's the context variable that will allow us to set breakpoints uh, which we'll see further ahead so yeah the way to use this and it's just missing an end at, at the end um, so for example here what we want to test we wanted to test a specific case that that we were having a problem with so we had an investment people like you make an investment um, you want to cancel that investment but then a request to process the investment also comes at the same time, right? And at a specific point in the journey, uh, it was causing a, a concurrency issue. And so the way we tested this is, so we have the first block, which has a breakpoint just before the cancel operation is done. We'll see how this is implemented. Uh, then cancels the investment. And then on the second block, uh, we, we will have a breakpoint after process, and we you know, have the process operation. And so we didn't just call run with breakpoints, passing in the, the blocks. Um, and basically what this does is we just tell it, so run the first block up to the breakpoint, then wait, then run the second uh, process block up, uh, up until the breakpoints, then wait, and then uh, you know, uh, run the rest of the block uh, at the end. And so we, we can control exactly where we want to stop the first process and have the second process uh, go through. And so the only thing that's missing is that add breakpoint method that you saw that's not actually from the gem, that's like our um, abstraction uh, on top of what the gem offers. And it just allows us to, to make these calls like add breakpoint, passing in the breakpoints context, and like passing this before cancel. So the way we do this is just, we split it into, it's either before or after, and then it's the name of the met of a method. And then, so if it's if it's before, what we do is just we re-implement that method, and we just add the breakpoints here. And this is the way you do it on the gem. So breakpoints, and you add the breakpoint name, which incidentally we use this. And so you have the breakpoint, and then you call the original method. If it's after, that's kind of the same thing. You you call the original method. You have to store the value. You add the breakpoint. You return the value. And so yeah, this allows us to quickly set up breakpoints on methods. And, uh, and test out our concurrency issues that way. So yeah, that's it from me. Uh, I'd be very interested to know if like any of you has had sort of these problems and maybe have like the same solutions or different solutions. So yeah, if you have any questions, comments. Uh, who writes the 
your cu cucumber uh, tests? Developers. Yeah. Developers. Currently, yeah. Currently, that's the way we do things. Developers will code and then write also write the tests for our spec in cucumber. Uh, we could have them, you know, written by the product owner uh, just before the feature is even coded. Yeah. Uh, we're not at that point yet. Maybe we'll be in the future. Do you do it that way? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> yeah, but you but might. I'd be interested to do it as well. Yeah. Do you think it's realistic that that will happen? If you have, if you have product people that uh, have, uh, you know, uh, uh, like understands a bit of technology, just a bit, and, and are kind of uh, have a oriented to processes and, and you know very logical then yes if you have those product people that are more in line with marketing fads etc maybe that's not such a good idea also also sometimes the issue arises when you have to create new steps like if you have to create steps that aren't provided already by the framework then you have to know how to write regular expressions you have to know the code that actually uses so that's when things get yeah. tricky I mean yes. developers could write those steps yeah. if they need it is that the reason you use it in the first place? Like, why do you not just, you know, stay with, like, let's say, our spec and uh -huh. just have We could. Uh, we could. Uh, I think Cucumber is, is useful even just even if it's just the, from, uh, by developers for developers. I think it's useful mm -hmm. as it really gives you a, a high level sense of what the feature does, and not necessarily all team is, is up to date on what's being done or like new, as new developers join in it's, it's useful just for the developer to see oh so this is how it works right. so I think there's some value in that just a question so you happen to also and I'm quite interested in that approach but using Cucumber as a way of documenting because yeah. you kind of in Ruby you don't place comments in code because it's ugly you don't place it on our spec and nobody knows what, what the hell is going on yeah. once you get into uh, a big code base so you kind of also have that purpose of internal documentation, yeah. extracted to some like way. living documentation. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what I'm uh, one thing that would be very useful, I, I, at least the last time I checked, there weren't such good tools for it. For it is just having a tool to to check, like uh, to easily check all of your cucumbers, like a web interface or something like that. Uh, that makes them accessible and visible for for the whole company, and then even for non-developers as well. Uh, but I haven't found a good tool yet for that. Yeah. Do you write JavaScript tests? Uh, we don't write like unit JavaScript tests yet. Uh, maybe we should. Um, yeah, we have um, we have a few like we do like jQuery plugins, like our own jQuery plugins, and we should definitely have uh, unit J unit JS tests for that. We don't. Uh, we we only rely on these uh, like more user centric tests. So you test the front end using Capybara? Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We test that some operations happen as a result of the user interactions, right. and user and sometimes those user, user interactions have the, the JavaScript thing. Right. But but it's not exhaustive as you said. So yeah, we should. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, the, when you test the front end, do you test uh, completely as a white uh, a black box? Or do you check for the presence of records in the database? No, yeah, we cross we, those boundaries. Yeah, we, we do. We cross those boundaries. Yeah. Right, that we don't, we're not, you know, very strict in. We just do what, whatever you know, works. Really. Uh, you um, you mentioned when you were doing your uh, tests uh, with Ajax that one of the worst things is natural. Mm -hmm. Having to wait for the Ajax request to finish, yep. and I see you adding a few extra steps to your cucumber, uh, mm -hmm. whatever test yep. feature, yep. Yep. Uh, to actually wait for those requests. Uh, my my question there is: Is there any test where you don't need to wait? Why isn't that default behavior? Mm, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, either you either you have to sp specifically wait in your steps. Mm -hmm. Or you have to make sure that the default implementation has a waiting implementation, right? Okay. That's the two ways. So if you do the second, then you don't need to litter your, your tests with yeah. that, 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 those lines. Yeah, that may be better. Um, yeah. That may be better, period. Or I would have to check that that may be, 
that may add also some more extra time to all tests. Maybe it depends on the implementation. Perhaps. But yes. And so asking if there is any case where you don't need to wait. Oh yeah. Um, mm, mm. Well, like when you follow a link and it, it's, for example, it's not AJAX and it's not a new page. It's just it's JavaScript and it just shows some content. Mm -hmm. Then you wouldn't have to wait, right? But if the waiting implementation is well done, then it won't actually add any time, in, right, to the test. So, yeah. so yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. Thanks. <laughs> so, did anyone have one of these problems, like when we tested? No. I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, how, how do you fix them? We hide in with the full. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, yeah, we had we had some issues with uh, programming AJAX. Uh, we have an issue um, at this stage. We rely a lot on external providers, so you know, simple kind of blocking is something that's blocking us. Mm -hmm. Even not not just because of the rate limiting, but even because of the fact that you don't have testing environments. Period. Mm -hmm. You go live. That's it. Yeah. There's kind of no way of catching regressions. Um, so yeah, I think uh, there are a couple of, of solutions, but we're kind of in the process of implementing them. Not, not yet there too, but that's mm -hmm. kind of our main main concern. Would be that. And some quirks with with Phantom JS and yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe maybe you can also talk a bit about the parallel tests thing, like get some insight as well. All others. Uh, yeah, we were experimenting with parallel tests as well. So uh, parallel tests is just a way to parallelize your tests, like in the same machine, uses different databases, and then you know if you have several cores, you can you can run the tests faster like that. Um, on a good machine, it, it turns those 45 minutes to 10 minutes, I think. Um, that's not what, what we actually use in our um, continuous integration environment. We actually use a gem called Specjure, which distributes our spec and also Cucumber through the Bonjour protocol, which is like the local network protocol. And it, it, so it distributes across computers and, and not only across cores in a single machine. And, and that reduces to 12. Uh, but you don't have to have good machines everywhere, so you have some older machines, uh, 12 minutes that is. But the thing with, with, uh, with that setup that we have is uh, sometimes the developer will just you know, uh, try out the new MySQL version or whatever it is and, and you know, uh, destroy uh, the environment that he has. And then suddenly the tests are failing, right? So that's an issue that we, need, we are looking at right now and looking to migrate those to the cloud and have like, uh, you know, machines that nobody messes with to run those tests and, and make sure that there's no flakiness coming from experiments that someone uses. Yeah. Use Docker. Yeah. 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 Yeah.